This video is going to be about the continuation of this project of the aluminum case for the GoPro camera. In the previous video I showed making the front part of this case and what I did for that. And in this video we're going to be showing making the doing the machine work on making this back cover for the case as well as a few shots of um, making a fixture that I've always wanted to make for the Mazak and this seemed like a good excuse to do it to cut this chamfer on the back with a 5-axis cut to show it in the video. Um, not the most efficient way to do it but I thought it might be interesting to see in the video. So that's what this video is going to be about. So let's get to the machining. Here's the machining operation on the um, back lid, the first operation to machine it. This is the uh, just roughing off the OD of this round bar. I'm using round bar just because it's easiest to hold on to in this kind of a machine. It's probably not the, I mean it's not efficient for material usage but it's just an easy way to get this done. As I said before that's not the best way to rough off the OD even. It's just an easy way to program it. So I'm doing it that way and the tool was already in the tool changer. So, so the next tool is the half inch end mill. It's kind of hard to see anything here. I can't really run it without coolant on it because it's with aluminum. Aluminum will kind of weld itself to these carbide end mills and, and it, it'll load up the tip of the end mill and, and it'll um, probably break the tool or, or mess the part up. So I'm just trying to run this as best I can without coolant, but right here I have to run coolant on it. There I'm kind of pulsing the coolant off and on, trying to, uh, you know, let you see what's happening here. But this is the first roughing tool, it just roughs down the part, the general features of the part. I think this is a finish pass around the OD of the back cover here slowed the video down right here so you can kind of see the actual speed it was running at for the finish cut the other part was of course sped up just you couldn't see anything anyway with all the coolant I'm just trying to show you every tool that is in this particular little setup here so that's the half inch end mill it roughs the bulk of the stock off I come in with a quarter inch end mill here to rough out a little more of the corners on the inside of the um, pocket here, the cavity and the cover. Kind of pulsing the coolant off and on there to clear shavings and stuff. Okay, this is a eighth inch end mill and it there's some small features that uh, go around the hinged bosses and, and uh, inside the inside radiuses are smaller and that's what this tool does. Here again it's kind of hard to see anything so I just sped it up. It, it looks actually a little more interesting sped up. You really can't see too much detail because all the coolant but I really can't run this tool without coolant. It's going to load the tool up and break the tool if I do that in aluminum. So it's uh, here again, it's just roughing the corners out closer to the finished radius and then it takes some finish passes around the part again. Here this is just a chamfer on the inside of the um, lip of a lid, 60 degree chamfer, or 60 degree included angle on the tool, 30 degree chamfer I should say, on this. I was able to turn the coolant off here so I, you could see what was happening. And the next tool, I believe, is this custom tool I ground on my uh, tool and cutter grinder to make the, the groove for the seal. I wasn't uh, incredibly happy with the finish this tool made, but it had to be small in diameter because it would otherwise it hit the hinge bosses. And it worked all right. I probably have to polish that a little bit on the bottom of the groove to really get it right. It, it probably doesn't matter. It's sealed all right anyway. This is a little uh, 1 16th inch ball mill. 
that's going to just cut off the radius on the two hinge bosses so that the, the lid can pivot properly. That's all it's doing. I really couldn't use a corner rounder in there because it would hit the the inside lip where the you know where the seal groove is. So here's a um, the half inch end mill again, roughing off the where the dovetail um, you know closure clamp thing is going to go, and then it roughs off and finishes the back of the lid down far enough so that when I cut the chamfer on the other side it'll clean up. So that's what it's doing there, just roughing back the back side and then it takes finish passes on that on the, on the face with the side of the end mill. Which is what it's doing there. That's the last one. And a spot for the a 16th inch drill that drills the, the hinge pivot holes here. You still have to run the coolant on this or else it might load the tip of that. I'm using that ball end mill again to spot for the drill, which works all right, but a ball end mill doesn't have a lot of clearance on the tip, so you really can't run it dry. Here's a 16th inch drill to drill the holes for the hinge pins. Both, uh, on both of the bosses there. I think the next tool is a chamfering tool. It, it chamfers the, what would be the outside chamfer on the lid all the way around except for where the dovetail area is, like I would, the shank of the tool would run into that. This does a chamfer as far as I can around there. Then I come back from the vertical direction with the tip of this same tool to finish it after I cut the dovetail, which is the next tool coming up. Really couldn't run this dovetail tool without coolant on it. So it's got quite a bit of coolant showing there. You can't really see anything, but it's cutting the dovetail on that little um, closure deal that I'm using to hold the camera case closed. You can see the cutter there just for an instant. We come back with this back champ. This, this is a double chamfering tool, so I'm chamfering the, finishing the chamfer on the back of the case cover. The outside, I should say, actually. When it's in the camera case. So that finishes the machining on that, all of that. Then here I, I think I show a little scene coming up of it. Of a, I was cutting it off on the bandsaw. I probably could have used a circular cutter in the, in the mill, but this would just seem like an easier way to go. So that's cutting it off as close as I can without hitting the, the saw blade on the part itself. took that with my phone so it's kind of a little bit hard to see. And then here I'm, I'm, this gave me a good excuse to make this fixture I've always been wanting to make to hold a vise in this manner in the Mazak. Because sometimes I'm tied up with the, on the horizontal mill with the job running and, and, I, and I need a little quick vise operation. And so I, I've been wanting to make this fixture for a long time but and just haven't got around to it, so this kind of gave me a good excuse to make it. I'm just going to mill this down here. This, I think this face mill is running at, at 3,500 RPM, and I'm feeding it at about 105 inches per minute, 200 thousandths depth of cut. I just kind of jump forward quickly through these roughing passes, so because you don't want to see this roughing this 
down it would just make the video too long and then I think the finished cut which it starts right here I think it was running the same RPM but 60 inches a minute for the finished cut on there and then we come back and tilt the spindle at 45 degrees to cut to finish the face of that big chamfer on the bar there right here we're doing that I had the retract clearance set kind of high for that and deeper the edges with the file I cut this just by manually cutting it I just tip the B axis at 45 and cut it base mill a chamfer on the end of the part there and here's the rest of the tools just to drill and tap for uh, 5 8 11 holes to hold various vices on this thing so that's the spot drill this is a 0.531 drill for the tap drill size for 5 8 11 And then uh, the 5x11 tap. Kind of zoomed in on these spots on these videos, and it gets kind of grainy because I'm just using the you know the scaling factor in in the in Premiere to get closer. And also, the, there's not a lot of light when the spindle's facing downward that way, and the, and the GoPro camera has a little trouble with that. I put the um, angle lock vise on here, and just indicating the jaw in parallel to the Y axis. Tapping it around. I noticed this brand. This is a brand new vise, and you see how much wave there is in the jaw when I run that indicator across. See the. I don't know if you could see it, the needle wiggling back and forth. That's a brand new vice, brand new vice jaws. I was a little bit disappointed in the flatness of those jaws on that vice. Here's a five axis cut. I did this chamfer on the other side of the case this way. This is the last operation, machining operation on this part. And I thought I'd just demonstrate this. This is probably not the most efficient way to do it. And it's hard, it's very hard to video this, uh, this kind of thing because there's so much movement there's nowhere to put the camera even this little GoPro camera there's nowhere to put it to get a a real good view of this I tried the first pass around from here so you could see the general movement of, the, of all the axes and then I moved it to the spindle face here so we could actually see the end mill down there cutting and it, it's kind of Odd the motion because you're you're actually riding on the space of the on, on the face of the spindle here, watching the tool. So it kind of it kind of looks kind of strange because the tool looks like it's tipping. Well, it is tipping, but the camera is riding like it. And then I, I got the idea. Well, I'll, I'll try to mount the camera on the y-axis, and you can see the degree of motion here the camera when the spindle tips over there the camera almost ran into the tool holder here and that sort of didn't really work out that great either I just couldn't get a good angle on this here I, I actually re-ran the finish pass of the the tool trying it again at, at the, on the spindle's face so that's that's what this is actually So you can kind of see the motion. This is a full five-axis cut here. This is not probably the most efficient way to do this. A chamfering tool would have done it quicker and easier. But I just wanted to show this. I thought it might be interesting to see. But it's kind of difficult to to um, show it because you can't get a good angle on the camera, and I can't. I I don't really have a camera I can mount inside the machine where I could put like a macro lens on it or something like that.
Okay, here's the um, camera case as it exists right now. I've, um, I've actually been using this because a little bit to film the last segments you've seen in this video because this case finally gave up and the, and the um, tabs broke off. And you can see it's got a big broken spot here in the case so it really won't even seal anymore with the, the, the lid seal and um, I don't know you know so I had to I had to kind of give up on this case so even the last segments in this video are, are recorded with this with the new case and these are the the buttons I'm experimenting with I just kind of um, use some of this silicone uh, I think it was a Permatex gasket sealer material and I stuck the camera in here with tape I put tape over these buttons and I stuck it in here and um, just filled these full of uh, full with this silicone and uh, let it dry but the silicone stuck to that tape the scotch tape I used pretty good so it's a little hard to get the camera out of here fortunately I was able to get it out of there and and um, you can see the the buttons kind of conformed inside here to the the camera the GoPro camera and it, it actually works pretty good so when the camera's in here oop, upside down the camera's in here in the case and we put the the back cover on oh on the back cover I just uh, I ordered some film material from this plastic supplier and they said they had it in stock on their website but then when it comes to actually processing the order they told me they can't ship it till the 27th of July so um, I can't get it for that's right now it's July 8th 7th or 8th 8th today where I'm making this video and but I ordered it way back in the beginning of July and uh, kind of irritates me that a supplier they said they had it in stock on their website but then when you actually process the order it said no we gotta back order it and so I, I actually cut the the window of this back it kinda scratched up it doesn't really look that nice I don't know if you can see that in the video the, the scratch you see the the scratches and stuff in this but this is the this is the window on the on a GoPro case commercial GoPro case and I cut it off carefully, as careful as I could with the exacto knife blade, and then I just glued it in here with some uh, super glue stuff, to so that I could at least use this case because my uh, my other my other case, of course, is is non-functional now. They, the there's no way to mount it because the tabs broke off. So I actually like I said use this case here to shoot the last few scenes that you've seen in this video so when this is, goes together I can um, I put little pins in the hinge bosses here I'm actually made machine two of these cases this is the other one that I made in the last video on this and I still have to put these little notches for these uh, these pins so that they can hook in here when you put the, the back cover on like that and it pivots around so when, when I close this off I made this uh, I might if I ever make another one of these I might make that seal a little bit looser because it's pretty hard to to um, close but anyway so now if I push the button on the on the front of the camera with this deal here it turns the camera on as you can see and I can push this side button gotta push it kinda hard but it does work and I can uh, get that display with the side button I can even press with my finger on this on this um, but this is the original GoPro back cover so you, you would figure it would work and then on the top button here I can press it and it'll go into the record mode you can see that there press it again and it turns it off 
so everything functions all right these buttons are not really very they don't really look very good right now I, this is just a an experiment to um you know to try the idea out i might come out with some uh better way to uh to do that so it looks a little nicer but it does work it, it, there's enough flexure in this in this silicone rubber that it'll actually press the button by just bending itself you probably can't see that on the I don't know if you could see this or not you can see it here a little bit and when I press it, it it it's enough to to activate the button so that's where the case stands right now. The only thing I have to do now is make the um, some little clasp things that, like you saw if you watched the previous video, that would uh, hold it closed up here, and it should be ready to go. And I also have my little air knife thing on this case to blow the the air across the lens of the of the. I, I still need to come up with some kind of a um, coating or something that's kind of like Rain-X just doesn't hold up to this coolant. It, it holds up only for a few minutes and then it, it's gone. So if there was some kind of something I could put on that lens cover that would um, last a little longer where it would blow the coolant off of the spin, the, I mean the um, coolant off of the face here better it would be nice I haven't come up with anything on that yet so I just got to make the little uh, deal that holds this closed and this will be fully functional then